So, um, thank you ever so much for um, joining us this evening. This is the first in a series of 10 webinars that has been organised by our Northern Ireland Botanical Skills Project. That project is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Is their logo up here hovering above me and uh, is being delivered by us, the BSBI, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. This project is aiming to um, deliver uh, botanical support, skills, training and essentially upskill people in Northern Ireland and elsewhere in um, botanical skills, no matter whether somebody's already pretty much an expert or if somebody's just starting out. Um, and so um, if this is the first you've heard of us, we're going to have another three years of activities that you can either join with us online or in person in Northern Ireland. Um, if you've only found out about this talk, there are nine more on various topics, some of them for beginners, some of them for intermediate and expert botanists, and they're all on the events page of the BSBI website. So please do feel free to go and have a look at that afterwards. Um, and before we get into the talk proper, I'd just like to say that the, the BSBI um, absolutely runs on the support of um, volunteers and members. Um, every county in Britain and Ireland has a, a vice county recorder, which is a voluntary position, and our society really runs on, on, on the support that's provided. We also um, rely on donations and membership, and so if you want to support the society in some way, please consider becoming a member or providing us with a donation. And I know a lot of you have provided a donation for attending this talk, which we really appreciate. So um, I'm going to introduce Jen and um, and then hand over to Jen to talk to us about plant and flower anatomy. So Jen works for us, the BSBI, as our botanical skills officer in Northern Ireland. Jen has been involved with teaching plant identification and plant and flower morphology for over 15 years. Uh, she's taught botanists from complete beginners to those studying for an MSc in Plant Taxonomy and Biodiversity at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh. In her current role, Jen is particularly keen to demystify looking at plants and assist people in building confidence in their observational and identification skills, which as far as demystifying and assisting people, I think tonight's talk is going to be perfect for that. If during the talk you have any questions, there is a Q&A function at the bottom and there will be a Q&A section at the end. So if anything occurs to you during the talk, drop it in the Q&A and I will serve up some of those questions at the end. That's enough of me talking. So I'm now going to hand over to Jen. Good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for coming along to this webinar. It's great to see so many people here. Um, so our, the talk I'm doing this evening is getting started with plant and leaf anatomy. And I'm going to try and keep this as um, simple in sort of things of terminology uh, as, as I possibly can. Um, where I do need to use technical terms, I will define them. And um, But I, throughout, I'll try and keep things language as simple as possible. Before we get started in, into the sort of the general anatomy of plants, I just want to, to talk briefly about a, an important distinction between um, two large groups within the flowering plants. And those are the monocots and the dicots. The name monocot comes from the fact that these plants have one seed leaf, which is called a cotyledon, so monocotyledon. Um, they frequently have parallel veins, but not always. Their flower parts are usually in multiples of three, but in some cases, as in the grasses and sedges, these the flower number, the number of parts in the flower have been reduced right down. And their vascular bundles, which we will come to and I will explain further, uh, are scattered throughout the stem. And as a result of this, they can't produce secondary woodiness like um, most of the broadleaf trees and, and also things like conifers can do. Dicots 
also got their name from dicotyl so they're dicotyledons they have two seed leaves the uh, vascular bundles the veins are usually net in a sort of a net like um, structure flowers are usually in fours or fives but the, it does vary and um but they're very rarely in parts of three and the vascular bundles in the stem are in a ring and because that ring encloses, includes a actively growing section called the cambium, it means that these plants are able to put down secondary woody growth. So, little question for you, and you can either put your, your answers in the, in the Q&A now, or you can leave it until later on when I'll ask it this again. Do you think this is a monocot or a dicot? It's got... Um, nice net veins, uh, it's got showy flowers, big fat lovely seeds. This is of course black bryony, Pamus communis, which is part of the yam family. So uh, and it's like its uh, tropical cousins um, also produces storage bodies under the soil. So we'll come back to that. I'd love to know what you think. So I'm just going to talk a bit more about vascular bundles. And um, the reason I'm doing this is because they can be quite important whenever we are actually looking at how leaves and, and stems and um, trunks of tree-like structures are made up. So our vascular bundles are made up of two different types of tubular cells. First of all, we have xylem uh, and the xylem are um, once they have grown and developed to the, the size that they need to be, these cells die completely. They no longer have any living sort of um, organelles or nucleus or anything like that in them. So they are effectively become hollow tubes. And they carry water from the roots. And then we have the phloem. And the phloem have to be living cells because they are responsible for actively moving the large molecules from the products of photosynthesis from the photosynthetic cells through into these tubes to carry to other parts of the plant which are actively growing and or down to storage organs wherever they may be. In terms of the xylem, they uh, work through very fine cells called root hairs um, on the roots um, and they gather moisture through the process of osmosis. So going from a gradient of low water, high water to low water concentrations. Of course, the cytoplasm like our cells have got some salts in them. So that's also causes an osmotic pressure. Um, and then that water travels either around or through the cells close to uh, the root hair, through into the xylem, and then the water moves up the plant through at the pressure caused by something called evapotranspiration. I will come back to that, don't worry. Phloem, on the other hand, as I said, need to remain uh, as, as living cells. So what they have is are called companion cells, which are these structures here. So this is our, our phloem tube, and it is accompanied by two companion cells. And these are adjacent to other cells. And through a process called active transportation, the large molecules of photosynthesis, such as um, sort of semi, sort of slightly more complex carbohydrates, um, some sugars, um, amino acids, proteins, products of cell metabolism, um, et cetera, they get carried um, using energy through cell walls and end up in the, the fluid within the, the phloem. And that fluid can travel either up or down depending on where it's needed. So we're here we have a, a sort of a, a sort of a, a basic cartoon of how that all works. So say we have a, a, a biosaccharide sucrose um, being produced by our source leaf cells. We've got our chloroplasts here, these green blobs. That is moved into the companion cell. Oh, I beg your pardon. That's moved into the companion cell of, of the phloem and 
Um, because, as I was saying earlier, there's a concentration of sugar in here that draws water from the xylem across to dilute it. That can then move down through the plant, either to, um, in this case, to a root cell where it would probably be formed into starch molecules to act as a storage organ. But it can also go to the actively growing parts of the plant, so young leaves or um, flowers, etc. So anywhere that where energy is needed, or protein is, is needed, or hormones are needed, they all that's that's where they go via the the phloem. So this is why I wanted to talk about monocots and dicots and vascular bundles first. The the way the vascular bundles these these groups of of these these sort of transporting tubes um, are arranged in plants, whether they're monocots or dicots, is very significant for how these plants then can grow. On the left here, we have a monocot stem. So where you can see that our our bundles of vascular um, things, we have a larger one closer to the center of the of the stem, two smaller ones slightly further out. We have our photosynthetic cells near the surface, as you would expect, and then our epidermis, which is basically the outer skin and a waxy cuticle protecting all of that and stopping as much evaporation of water through those um, front cells as possible. You've got this sort of lovely bubbly um, cell masses around the vascular bundles and the water will come through those uh, cells into this bubbly lot and, and to any other cell that is needed to, to keep them in, in prime condition and uh, maximum turgidity. So that basically means the cell's full. Um, and then we have our phloem closest to the photosynthetic areas, uh, which are, as I said before, they're going to actively transport whatever products these cells provide. The main difference to show, to see, or to notice is that inside the dicot stem, we've got two structures which just don't exist in this stem. First of all, we have something called the cambium, this orange layer here, that separates the, um, the xylem from the phloem. But this is an actively dividing cell layer. And because of that, it means that the phloem is always on the outside of that layer which means that photosynthetic products can always move into that. And the xylem can, this grows continuously. Um, so it expands that way and this way, producing more phloem, uh, more phloem bundles towards the outer stem and more xylem bundles towards the inner stem. And this, this layer is, is pure, is, is totally responsible for secondary growth or, and or, um, creating wood. So the annular rings that you see whenever a tree has been chopped down or um, through a branch, this is where that happens. It's all to do with the cambium layer. This endodermis layer is the other thing that we don't have in the monocots, and that is protecting the moisture within this area. Uh, it's basically a waterproof cell layer. So this outer bit um, this can, if necessary, it can be damaged. It could it could dehydrate entirely. They would lose some photosynthetic function potentially, but because you've got this actively growing cells here, um, it wouldn't take very long for the plant to regenerate this this outer uh, layers of cell. We've got a continuous band of of photosynthetic cells here. Our nice um, airy collenchyma at the front and are, are sort of very, very loosely packed um, cells behind that. So now I'm going to go into the vegetative parts of a plant and their basic structures. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the roots and, um, and then we're going to move through the parts of the plant um, in this sequence. I've talked about the cambium already as being part of the areas which are actively dividing cells. We have a couple of other areas which are actively dividing cells, which are very important. 
um, to the plant for its survival and um, reproductive success, etc. The main one is the, the bud right at the tip of the plant here, the terminal bud, also called the apical bud because it's at the apex of the plant. This is the, the major bud responsible for the, the elongation and growth of the plant. A lot of the, uh, any, any cell, any parts of the plant which are produced after this point in time where these flowers are, will the, their nature will be entirely determined by the hormone activity within the apical bud. But we also have auxiliary buds in the axle of the leaf and the stem. You could also call these secondary buds. They are always placed between the, the leaf and the stem in that axle, and you won't find them very easily, if at all, in monocots. So this is very much this presence of a very definitive and definite um, distinguishable auxiliary bud is very much a, a much more dominant within the mono, the dicots. We also have another area of active division of cells, and that's down here in the um, the root, right at the base of of the uh, right at the tip of the root. We have an area called the root cap, which is basically a protective layers of cells as the, the root is pushing through um, soil, it stops. This takes all the abrasion and erosion and the meristem, the area where we've got actively dividing cells um, and differentiating cells uh, is behind that. The cells are given whatever role they, um, they need at that point in time. And then the area above this is where the cells elongate and that's this elongation of the cells is what pushes the root down through the soil. Here we have a, a transverse section through the top of an apical bud and some lateral buds. We've got a leaf primordia on the, the left here, another one on this right side. And we have our leaf, uh, our apical bud, our terminal bud right here in the middle. There's already the formation of secondary buds either side of it. And then we have these lovely big fat um, secondary axillary buds at the axis between the, the main part of the plant and the leaf primordia either side. So we're going to have a closer look at tap roots now. <clears throat> uh, at roots, actually, not, not just tap roots. There are three main types of roots. We have tap roots, uh, which we're familiar with in terms of things like carrots, parsnips, dandelions, if you're a gardener, etc. Then we have fibrous roots, which you're more likely to see on things like uh, grasses or lettuce, again, if you're a gardener. But so there can be a mix of both fi fibrous and tap root. Tap roots tend to be storage organs. Um, fibrous roots are more likely to be feeding organs, feeding roots. Um, so you do see a mix of them, but some plants only have fibrous root systems. And that's a very common characteristic within a lot of the monocot um, family uh, group, uh, especially in the grasses, uh, grass-like uh, plants. And then we also have what are called adventitious roots. And these are roots which come from a part of the plant uh, which is not normally associated with roots. You can also have adventitious shoots. So adventitious just effectively means coming from an area where you wouldn't normally expect it to be coming from. So here we have a lovely fat tap root of a dandelion. Uh, you can see that the secondary um, roots have got these lovely feeding, fine feeding fibrous roots coming off them. And the main body of the the dandelion root here is going to have cells full of starch molecules. So they're basically storing lots of energy for whenever, for if this, uh, the top of the plant becomes um, damaged or somebody tries to dig it up. And, and then all that, this energy here is used to, first of all, initiate lots of buds around the, the root edge, um, but also, and then sort of to, to push those leaves up through the soil until they reach the light and can start photosynthesizing again. 
So this is a very, a very important survival um, technique for a lot of plants. And we've taken advantage of that in our domestication of, of the root vegetables that we use. We also have tap roots coming here on this tree. This is a pine tree, some species, lots of fallen needles around it. And in this case, they're very much using the tap roots here to anchor themselves as securely as possible into this very poor substrate of basically sort of eroding what looks like sandstone type material with a very thin soil layer. So in the, in the thin soil layer and in those cracks down through the sandstone, there will be lots of feeding roots getting as much nutrient and water as they possibly can. But these large roots are primarily there to help um, secure the tree as well as possible into that very um, not very good substrate. So here we have a little cartoon of how um, the um, the uh, xylem and phloem work in terms of we have uh, sugars being produced in the leaves of this this beet. They're being taken down through the phloem down to a sink cell, which happens to be in the root um, and will be stored as starch. And here are a few little cartoons of the different types of underground storage bodies that plants have evolved to, to cope with either um, very hot summers, so they only flower in spring, or um, uh, they're, they're herbaceous, so all their growth, top growth dies off during the winter, et cetera. So, so these are, are, are many of the different types that you would find. And those are the only, the, are, these are just the below ground ones. Fibrous roots, as, as I said, are frequently are frequently found within the monocot, fam monocot families, uh, but also in some of our um, dicot families as well. So, for example, the creeping buttercup here has very fibrous roots. The slightly thicker ones, again, are anchoring roots, and then our feeding roots would be the very fine fibrous ones coming off that. And on this side, we have marum grass, a and area, which is a hugely important um, grass in terms of stabilizing blown sand at the front of dune systems. And uh, it's an, an it's um its adaptations to that environment are are fabulous, to say the very least. If the plant starts off down here, you can see this is probably a good meter, maybe a meter and a half of of sand, blown sand that has accumulated over these plants. If the plant has started off down here and this has accumulated over, say, 20 years, then uh, as it grow, as the sand gets deeper, the root and the plant grow and then produces more fibrous roots on the layer. And then it goes up again and produce, does the same. And then it goes up again, it does the same. So you get this fantastic layer cake of fibrous roots going all the way up through this um, developing dune system and maintains the green um, photosynthetic uh, material of the plant right at the top where there's light. And just to show just how fine these these leaf, these uh, the um, roots are on marum grass, these are these are ones that have been exposed to you know to to the wind and and so on. So they've lost the extremely fine parts of their roots here, but but you can still see that these are incredibly fine roots and very important to the survival of the plant and to the stabilization of sand, to the extent that people actually go and plant marum grass where they have problems with sand erosion on coastal areas. Now we're gonna go and have a look at ad adventitious roots. Um, as I said before, um, a lot of monocots, especially, uh, so you would see this in maize or uh, zea maize, would, use, would produce uh, adventitious roots from the leaf nodes where, so that's the base of, the, of a new leaf, the leaf sheath going up the plant. So you can see a leaf sheath here and the blade will be coming off somewhere above. This is a leaf sheath with the blade coming away here. And in a lot of ways, these are not just um, being produced to provide more nutrient to the plant, but also to provide stability as the plant gets higher. And they're very important for that function. And in those terms, they're, they're usually described as being prop roots. Here we have um, a, an orchid, I'm afraid I don't know which genus, 
And they produce uh, adventitious roots going up the, again from leaf nodes as the, the plant grows. And because these would be epiphytic on trees, sometimes on stones, um, these help to both anchor the the, the, um, the plant as firmly as possible against the whatever they're growing on. But they also are used to absorb um, moisture from the air and nutrients from, from rain. Just to give you an idea of just how um, important these, these secondary adventitious roots can be to some plants, here we have uh, a red mangrove um, tree growing in, in, in seawater. And you can see the, the huge range these, these big adventitious roots have. So this is a dicot, this isn't a monocot, this is a plant that, um, or a group of plants which are incredibly important for um, the stability of, of coastal areas, especially where there are typhoons and hurricanes, and where people have taken them out for, um, in a rather short-sighted uh, manner. These are these are not um, they're they've lost a huge amount of benefit from mangroves. The other one that you would see a lot of is is the in the screw pine, the pandanus species, uh, in in uh, places like Australia, and you can see the branches go slightly horizontal and they get lots of prop roots coming down from them. We also get adventitious roots coming from leaf nodes and dicots. So this is the a time leaf speed well, you can see there's lots of little roots coming from the individual leaf axles. And this happens, and the same with this seed in here, this happens whenever that, that stem grows horizontally across the surface of the ground and the, uh, the, um, the, the structures at the, the nodes um, respond to the moisture and start producing roots. Uh, the same has happened here on this sedum. And anybody who has grown sedums as, as ornamental plants know that if you knock off a leaf, the likelihood is that you can grow new plants just from that single leaf because of this um, ability. So we're going to have a look at stems now. Um, a stem is basically made up of um, a series of nodes and internodes. A node is an area where uh, a leaf has been before or a stem, and a node would usually be associated with also having an auxiliary bud or a secondary bud in the apex between the leaf and the stem. And the internode is effectively the space between those nodes. At the top of our stem, we would have a terminal bud, as I've talked about before, the growing point of this plant, and it might be forming young leaves, but usually the terminal bud is surrounded by and protected by lots of little scale-like structures. And you can often see the, the scars from those scales on, on pre, the previous years, um, uh, where the previous year's terminal bud had started at. The abscission zone is, a, is a, an area where there are specialized cells which can die and, uh, and therefore the plant removes its, its, the, uh, its leaf. And this can happen if there is an infection in the leaf, a virus, for example, or fungus or bacterium. Um, so that protects the rest of the plant. But it also, of course, happens at this time of year whenever they, the, the plants are shutting down for the winter, um, deciduous trees in particular, and they lose their leaves. And so you have an abscission zone here that um, they reabsorb as much of the nutrients as they can, and then the leaf falls off effectively. I've got a couple of just little sketches here. One's a winter twig, one's a summer twig, and they're both basically the same. We have alternating buds going up the stem. These are where leaves were last year with a leaf scar. We have our node, which still has an auxiliary bud at it. We have our terminal bud at the top, and we have um, the terminal bud scale scars right down at the base of this, this uh, stem. So that is one year's growth. It's just furnished with leaves here. Sometimes at the axle where the, um, the base of the leaf joins the stem and we have our secondary bud there, we also have structures called stipules. I will be talking more about those and, and sort of illustrating those with some um, uh, um, some more images later in the in the talk. Here we have a nettle which has got, um, you can see the sort of the auxiliary buds are vegetating up already 
we have our stipules, these little sort of ribbony things here, and then our long uh, leaf stem or petiole and our leaf blades. I just wanted to use these two images to show how distinctive the the scars from previous years can be. So these these for, sort of fresher scars here will have been from uh, the um, scales protecting the bud that was here previous in one or two previous years. Got leaf scars here and apical bud scars as well. And then big cluster of what are probably going to be flowers on this cherry, this wild cherry prunus avium. And here we have very large leaf scar on this um, uh, walnut with the scale scars around here and our apical bud and this lovely sort of horseshoe uh, uh, imprint of where the vascular bundles were attached. Bud arrangement is as important as leaf arrangement in determining um, what something is. And you can have lateral, we can have lateral buds which are opposite. So you would see that in things like sycamore, um, ash, um, elder. They're, they all have opposite buds, um, honeysuckle as well. A big cluster of terminal buds rather than in that little sort of, um, this little cluster here on a, on a little um, spoke off the main branch is, our, is typical of oak. Uh, these alternating buds on this sort of slightly silvery bark with these white dots on it is probably hazel. And I know I should know this last one, but I couldn't, I can't manage to figure it out yet. So if you think you know what that is, please do tell me. There is a fantastic um, poster you can download showing winter um, buds and twigs. Um, admittedly, these are common Irish trees, but many of them will be shared with the rest of, of uh, Britain. So it's it's well worth having a look at. It separates them out into opposite buds, etc. So very very uh, well worthwhile downloading, and it's free. So you get that from tree uh, uh, explorersie Another characteristic of of trunks are lenticels, and these are very important in maintaining good oxygen levels for those actively growing cells and working cells underneath the bark of a tree. These are the lentil cells of a hazel tree, a fairly mature part of a hazel tree. This is a type of willow, uh, these lovely corky ones. We've got these long, thin um, ones that are typical of birch. Um, this is um, pendulous uh, birch. And, and here we have a younger stem of an elder with these really quite large lenticels, but also these splits in the bark. And the splits in the bark relate to how the, the, um, the bark of older branches becomes much more knobbly and corky, especially in the case of this elder. But you can also see it in, in oak trees. They've got this lovely craggy looking um, uh, bark with lots of different pap, um, sort of levels in it and sort of flaky bits, which one is one of the reasons why they're so incredibly valuable for lots of invertebrates. The, the young bark is very smooth, but has little tiny lenticels all over it. And the lenticels still exist in this older bark, but they are frequently underneath all this flaky upper corky bark. The same with a uh, sycamore. You can see the the sort of the where the, the, the bark is likely to split as it gets older um, and uh, there would be lent cells there as well. So the difference in bark type from an old, a young tree to an old tree is can be quite significant. So now we have our leaves. Uh, our leaf is made up of a blade or a lamina, um, the leaf stem or petiole. We have our auxiliary bud and the axle between stem and leaf, and this makes up a node. We also have our midrib and our lateral veins. So I mentioned earlier, whenever I was talking about the, um, uh, the nettle, that we had stipules at nodes. And this is a characteristic that some families are have um, pretty 
uh, pretty much all the time. So these are all members of the rose family. We have here a dog rose with uh, two large stipules which are fastened to the leaf petiole, so they're not loose from it. Unlike these very fine ribbon-like stipules attached to this um, bramble leaf. And then we have um, an alcamilla or um, uh, probably alcamilla mollis with these huge, huge stipules which are almost, you know, sort of equivalent of a, another leaf effectively. Other families which have stipules um, typically and, and pretty much all the time uh, would be the pea family. So this is uh, red clover with these lovely purple veined stipules. The geranium family also has stipules and so it does the, um, the, the dock family, um, polygonaceae. But these ones are tubular so the new stem leaves all sort of come up through these individual tubular stipules. Leaf structures are really important for helping you determine whether or not you've got a monocot or a dicot. This is a, a typical dicot leaf. We have a mid rib, we have um, transverse veins or secondary veins going off either side. And uh, as you can see, the, the vascular bundles are slightly smaller on the sides than they are in the middle. This is a, a little bramble leaf that I had a look at, and um, you can see the midrib in the middle, we've got secondary veins and tertiary veins. So here we are, this is the secondary vein, tertiary vein. Then um, we've got these tertiary veins going into secondary veins, going into fourth level veins, going into fifth level veins, going so into sixth level veins. So you can see that the vascular bundles get really tiny, but they're so important that it's really important that they do because all the cells around in these little sort of groups here are all dependent on the nutrients and the and the water and the soluble minerals coming up through um, the xylem to these cells, but also for the transport away from those cells from the products that they've made during photosynthesis. And right at the edge here, we have what are called water pits or hydithoids, hydithoids. Um, and you can see cell, these vascular bundles go directly to them. And they are largely responsible for getting, for getting rid of either excess salt in, in the, the water coming up from the ground, or just for helping to um, relieve some of the, the, um, the water pressure within the leaf. It's not fully understood exactly what uh, the process um, uh, does for the plant, but it's it's a really important protein and also very pretty. So this is what happens. You get what's called gutation um, from these hydrothoids on the edge of the leaf, usually in the morning whenever it's cool. And they they just sort of sit there like lots of little crystal balls hanging off the, the tips of, of those um, leafed um, points. While the, um, those those veins going right out to the points of the leaf are, are really important um, for helping the plant remove excess um, water from its system. You can also get what are called collecting or returning veins, which are these wonderful sort of secondary veins that arch back into the midrib again. In this case, this, this is a melancholy thistle that's doing it, and this one is um, do, um, Enchanter's Nightshade. Uh, and here's an enchanter's nightshade uh, plant. In monocots, you have um, the vascular bundles arranged in parallel rows with uh, sort of the, the bubbly cells between them and uh, very large open uh, xylem vessels um, with, and often with the, the stoma, which I will come to in a second, um, either uh, both on top and underneath the leaf. Frequently in dicots, they're, they're only underneath the leaf, underneath the leaf surface at the back of the leaf, if you like. But in a lot of monocots, you get, you can have them on both surfaces. And here is uh, an example of how that looks in real life. This is a slide of um, marum grass vascular bundles. Wonderful smiley vascular bundles, I think you'll agree. Um, the, the lovely big blue broad smile is our phloem and the, the sort of the happy eyes are our big xylem vessels. 
and then these blue um, horseshoe structures are actually um, the where the stoma, uh, the the stomata, the areas where uh, water vapor is released from the plant um, to help enable um, the plant to draw water up from the soil. It creates a pressure uh, differential. Um, that's where they are based. And these are incredibly, you know, not only are they incredible um, builders of sand dunes and adapted, have adaptations to do that incredibly well, they're also extremely drought tolerant and they can roll their leaves up into an extremely tight cylinder, a very shiny waxy cuticle on the outside, which helps to stop as much um, trans evaporation of the water through the outside of the leaf beg your pardon, uh, but inside these, there's as many structures as they possibly can can grow to, to flow down, slow down the airflow across the stoma and therefore slow down any evapotranspiration from those stomata. When it's nice and cool and there's plenty of water around, then the leaf can sort of fold out and be entirely flat. Um, and uh, if you happen to be on a sand dune, on a sort of a cool, slightly dampish day, do have a look to see the flattened leaves of a, a marum. The stomata are always in close proximity to uh, the vascular bundles, especially the xylem, because as I said, this the, the movement of water through the plant is, in, is entirely dependent on the stomata being able to open and the water vapor being dragged away by any passing uh, air movement and that differential in pressure the, of evapotranspiration as it's called is what um, draws water and soluble minerals up from the soil. This is another great poster that is also free from Tree Explorers IE. Um, this is all leaf shapes um, with different types of edge. We have overall serrated leaves um, Often these ones happen to have a toothed edge. This is hazel leaf. This is hornbeam, again, with a very toothed edge, slightly different shape. And here we have Irish white beam, Sorbus hibernica, again, with a very toothed edge and again, a very different base to the shape to the leaf. Oh, sorry. Um, the, a beech leaf is similar in shape to a hornbeam leaf, but it doesn't have all the toothing along the edge. Maybe has one or two little tiny teeth, but really it's basically a smooth edged leaf. This hay, uh, willow leaf is is quite spatulate. It's quite quite sort of, you know, you could imagine sort of flipping an egg or something with that S sort of shaped thing. Not necessarily that leaf, obviously. And then we have the privet leaves down here, which are very simple oval leaves, uh, very flat edge. And um, and they are oppositely arranged. When it comes to uh, lobing, a sort of typical one would be an oak leaf. You could also have a more sort of triangular, oblong type shape, as you would see here, the, the swarthorn, or a five pointed um, hand kind of sort of leaf shape, which you can see here in this in this uh, ivy. And whenever it's this five pointed shape, it's called a palmate leaf, as in five fingers on a palm. There's one way to remember that. Compound leaves are a in very important part of understanding leaf structures because a compound leaf will only ever have an auxiliary bud right at the base of the stem going to the rest of that large leaf with these small leaflets coming off it. There will never be an auxiliary bud at the base of this leaflet on this mid vein. And the same case is the case for this um, horse chestnut leaf, esculus leaf, the mid, the auxiliary bud will be where that leaf joins um, the woody stem. And again, also for this rose, uh, the, these alternately arranged leaves, compound leaves, the buds will be at the base of that leaf where the two stipules are, are attached to the base of the leaf and the little bud will be in there. Whenever you've got a, a, a compound leaf arranged like this, it's also called a palmate, palmately compound leaf. 
these ones are pinnate compound, um, all of these three. Bud arrangement, um, both on trees and on uh, non-woody plants is, is a very important part of, of sort of getting to grips with uh, which families you're looking at, especially when it comes to the herbaceous plants. Leaf arrangement can be spiral. So here we have rosebud willow herb with the leaves just spiraling round and round and round and round. And effectively, if you were to, to take a, a rosebud willow herb and, and squish it into a pancake, that would form a flat rosette of leaves on the ground, where basically the internode between the two leaf bases here, which is sort of an, about a centimeter, here would be less than a millimeter. So the whole internode has been reduced right down to the minimum size on, on the rosettes. Leaf arrangement uh, here, this is alternate. So I said already that this rose, rose is showing alternately arranged leaves, and so is this ivy. So you can see a leaf joining here, one there. This one is behind that one, but it's and then and then there. So those are alternate leaves. And then we have oppositely arranged leaves. So things like nettle have opposite, opposite leaves. But you can also see that they're opposite one way and then opposite the next way and then back again. And I call this the, um, the sort of north, south, east, west opposite leaf arrangement. The technical term is decussate. Uh, but for the, in terms of remembering it, uh, whenever you're right in the field, north, south, east, west works pretty well. You also see that in Centranthus, Red Valerian, and also um, throughout the pink families. So this is um, Stellaria, uh, this is chickweed, Stellaria media. So this is an arrangement, you can see how the, the bases of the leaves going north, south, east, west, north, south. And this, the stem of a, a nettle is square as a result. It's the most efficient um, form that a stem can take if you've got these um, opposite leaves which are alternating in their direction, being decussate, as I said. Last but not least, we have uh, leaves arranged in a whirl around the stem, typical of the um, uh, the bed straw family. This is this is um, cleavers, also known as sticky willy or jack run through the hedge. Um, Goosegrass, lots of common names for this one. This is Gallium apparine, the sticky one, which um, kids love to throw on each other's backs. And those, all the leaves are arranged around a, a, a particular um, orientation on the stem. And uh, there is no internode between um, each of where, where all those the leaves are, are attached. Next week, I will be talking about um, flowers, fruit, and different types of inflorescence. Um, so if you're interested in that, please do come along if you haven't already booked. And a couple of books that I would recommend which have really good glossaries. So glossaries are really important for getting the um, for getting rid of that fear of using a key. You're going to be you're going to encounter technical terms, unfortunately, and all good flower guides will have a glossary at the back. There are also really good glossaries online, um, which you could also, you know, sort of have linked to on your phone. I haven't encountered one that is a, an app yet, but I'm sure there's one out there. I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was one or not. Or not. The Collins Flower Guide is my go-to, you know, general book that I use to um, key things out. The keys are e keys are fairly easy. The pictures are good. Nice glossary. It's a, it's a bit of a brick because it covers everything from um, the uh, club mosses right up through to grasses, sedges, rushes, everything. All the monocots that we have in Britain and Europe. And if you're a little bit more adventurous and you would like to botanize in winter, uh, whenever there aren't any flowers around, then I would really recommend you getting a vegetative key to the British flora. The, the key thing with keys key thing with keys is that you practice find something that you know what it is creeping buttercup daisy doesn't really matter what dandelion and use the books to key those out 
you'll come to terms with some of their idiosyncrasies maybe but also it just sort of builds up your confidence in using the keys that are available to you. Another book that if you're really keen to learn about botanical terms um, and sort of take some of the fear out of that is the Cambridge Illustrated Glossary of Botanical Terms. This was recommended to me by a colleague earlier on today and she says she loves it so much that she actually looks at it while she's washing up so that she can learn all these terminal all these sort of complex terminology of uh, botanical terms and I believe her. So anybody have any ideas if this is a, a dicot or a monocot? What do you think? So I will hand over to James for the Q&A session now. Hello everybody, thank you ever so much for that. Um, so uh, Jen, I'm seeing in the chat, I'm seeing uh, in, in the Q&A, a few people have put, I've got one monocot and I've seen a number of people said dicot. Right, okay. Well, whoever said, whoever said monocot got it right. <laughs> well, um, congratulations to anonymous attendee who suggested monocot. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so the reason it's a monocot, I'll just briefly yeah, show you. Please do. The, leaves are, the flowers are in parts of three. If we were able to see the number of stamens clearly here, there would be six of those. We've got six petal like structures. We would have six stamens. There would be three little stigmas on the top of this ovary. And our, our fruit has got three chambers for, for seeds. So it just goes to show that it's important not to just to go on parallel veined um, leaves to determine whether or not something is a, um, a monocot. Brilliant, thank you ever so much, Jen. Um, whilst the presentation's um, still up, uh, Carol has asked if you could quickly review the xylem flow and osmosis transport cell again. Oh yes, of course. Um, just give me a sec, it's gonna take me a few a minutes. A moment to flick back A few through. seconds to run back through, especially because it, keeps on going don't want to move yet thank you and if anybody else has any questions please um please put them in the q a and i will see how many we can get through in the next 10 minutes so it was it where am i that one that you would like me to review I'm not certain, but I would imagine so, yes. Okay. Let me know if it if it isn't and I can find a different slide. Actually, this probably is a better slide, which is clearer. This one, that's it. Okay, so um, we have our xylem, which, as I said, are, are basically dead cells forming a tube. They movement of water through them is dependent upon moisture getting up to the leaves the those openings on the leaf surface the stom stomata becoming open and any airflow across the blade of the leaf actually pulling those molecules of water out of the leaf The phloem, on the other hand, as I said, are living cells because they have to actively transport the products of photosynthesis from the photosynthetic cell, which is called a, a source cell, if you like, uh, to other cells within the plant. Photosynthetic products um, are carbon based. Uh, they can be sugars, which can be converted into larger um, strings of carbohydrates uh, to make new cell walls. For example, pectin, lignin, they're all to, uh, sort of complex carbohydrates. Starch, of course, is a complex carbohydrate, but that's usually a, a more actively available energy source rather than a structural um, carbohydrate. And the cell walls are made up of pectins and lignins. So um, if you've got actively growing parts of a plant, a lot of these products from these these photosynthetic cells will be transported by the phloem to those areas. So we have source cells, which are usually the more mature leaves, which have stopped growing and they're actively 
uh, they're in good health and they're actively photosynthesizing and their products go to uh, what are called sink leaves and the sink leaves are those which are still developing they're still growing new leaves are new cells are being produced the cells are um, getting bigger elongating um, or also of course into the um, apical parts of the the, the the apical bud the places where active cell division is ongoing um, because all the components for the structure, the construction of not just the outer cell, but also, of course, the proteins, et cetera, that make up all the organelles within the cell, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the chloroplasts, et cetera, they all have to be transported as well. Um, so yes, any part, any growing, actively growing part of the plant is entirely reliant on these photosynthesizing, sort of photosynthetic cells doing their job, and on the phloem then being able to transport all of those fantastic products uh, that have come from a combination of sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to um, and whatever nutrients the plant has been able to find from uh, the water coming up from the roots to the various parts of the plant that are growing and maturing. Things like the starch, however, um, will be travel will be carried as a soluble sugar, such as sucrose, down into, for example, the roots into a storage body, like we saw in the um, uh, so in things like potatoes or carrots or um, dandelions, um, whatever any kind of storage body in in the roots for uh, in particular, and those starch. Um, the, those sugar molecules will be pulled down through the phloem. They'll be transported via their living companion cells into that storage cell in the root, for example. And there they would be converted into sort of the insoluble starch. And so you would get all these starch grains accumulated into, into the cells down in the roots. Um, so it's an incredible process. So, so not only do the cells that are photosynthesizing produce sugars for the plant. They produce all of the building blocks for the um, for every part of the plant's development, growth, and maturation. Is that that's brilliant? Thank you so much, Jen, and I, I hope that's um, answered your question, um, Carol. Um, We've got a oh a question from Heather um, at the beginning when I was saying the um, BSBI has our vice county recorders. Heather's one of our vice county recorders in Wales. Is the Leaf Shapes poster available online anywhere, Jen? Yes, um, it is available from. Let me get to it. Um, so the the it's the same place as the buds and twigs. So if you go to www tree um dash explorers dot ie you will be able to find both the buds twigs um buds and twigs of common irish trees and the leaves of common irish trees um on that website absolutely free for you to download and if you wish to get printed out into a huge beautiful a0 poster then you could well do so excellent thank you very much jen um, I know we've reached eight o'clock. Uh, we'll, we'll do another five minutes just to try and mop up some of these questions, but I'm afraid we might not get through absolutely everything. Um, B asks, is there any particular family you'd recommend starting out when learning to key, uh, either because they're quite different or there are only a few which would be difficult to get to species? Um... I can think of lots that I would recommend you don't start with. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me think. Well, um, I mean, you know, try and choose something which has got large. I can't. I can't think offhand. I might. I might do in a minute, but I can't think offhand of of a particular family. What I would suggest is uh, you try. Um, you go for things with large open flowers. So things like um, uh, geraniums or mm. sort of wild roses. Um, 
and only with the wild rose only to get to rosa you know actually if you know it's a rose then don't bother with that one um but having a, a larger flower um just makes it easier to see the reproductive organs inside and because a lot of keys concentrate on the co the flower characters rather than the vegetative characters that can be really helpful to be able to see those clearly um so buttercup the buttercup family is quite good um for that nice big flowers there is quite a bit of variation within the family once you get outside of the genus ranunculus the buttercup genus so genus is basically a sort of like um uh if we were all sort of we were all sort of had been uh, if, our, if all of our surnames were smith for example then that would be our genus um the genus for humans is Homo, and the species for humans is Homo is sapiens. So a specific name for it is Homo sapiens. So ranunculus is the genus name um, for for buttercups, and specifically. But you've also got things like aquilegias in there. You've got um, clematis, um, peonies, things like that. So there are shared characters across hellebores as well. There are shared characters across that family. Which, um, which are quite nice, but also the flowers are nice and big. So it's easier to see what your reproductive organs are and, and determine how many you've got. Um, or if you've just got so many, it's impossible to count, in which case it's more likely to be in Um Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think that's um, a good choice. It's a good group, um, and it's quite satisfying because I think people generally have an idea of what a buttercup is, but then of course within what we think of as typical buttercups, there's quite a few species to key out in there. Some of them quite common, some of them more unusual. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'd say is stay away from water crow foots to begin with. <laughs> yes, don't go for the white flowered ones that are in the water. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're quite tricky. Um, also, the the borage family. They're quite they're mm. quite user friendly. I mean, like I say, the same with roses. If you if you have a forget me not, you know it's a forget me not. You can try using the key on it, please do, but um, don't be disheartened if you struggle, because they the characters that you need to distinguish right down to species are tiny, but also they are things like what the the little sort of uh, seed at the base of the flower. What, whether it's shiny or not or what colour it is and things like that so so don't be disheartened but yeah the borage family is is quite a nice one because they're quite they different genera are quite different from each other Excellent. but also Thank with nice know. good family tra family traits to look out for Andrew asks are there any particular leaf structures more associated with particular habitats e.g acid soil and certain leaf structures versus calcareous substrates and other leaf structures or is there no particular correlation um there's no particular correlation between an acid um acid and, and calcareous or or al more alkaline um, I think probably the difference, the main difference between vegetation uh, on acid in comparison to alkaline is that it is, nutrients are locked up in acid soil. They're not as available. So this is why we get a lot of our, um, our carnivorous plants growing in acid soils. Nitrogen isn't available. Phosphorus isn't as available. Um, they get locked up into insoluble salts in acid soils. So not only do you have a greater diversity of plants on more alkaline soils, um, you also get plants which grow much more slowly on acid soils and probably have smaller leaves as well um, because it takes less energy to produce a leaf. Um, that is also potentially involved with, um, as partly to do with the fact that a lot of our um, acid lands are, tend to be upland where it's colder. Um, and in the days when we used to get snowfall, that they had to also be cold adapted. And during the winter, of course, when the water freezes, it's no longer available for the process of photosynthesis. So you had a reduced leaf size and shape and sort of very protected 
stomata, similar to the marrow grass, but on a much smaller scale, um, to stop losing water in winter whenever there wasn't any any um, liquid water available for the plants to take up for the purposes of photosynthesis. Um, another thing you might see more of on acid uh, land where it takes a lot to produce a new leaf is a lot of silicon in the leaves. So especially in the grasses, you would uh, they would be rough either up or down the leaf edge. Uh, you'd feel little barbs um, to stop herbivores being um, quite so keen to eat them. I hope that helps a yeah. little bit. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, are there any books you would recommend to learn more about the plant functions that you have been covering? That's from Barbara. Um, to be honest, Barbara, a lot of what I have used um, for those kind of things in the webinar have come from really good um, educational sources online. I can certainly put together a, a list of the, the sources I've used. Um, I had hoped to do that and have that at the end of the, the lecture as well. Um, but uh, but certainly, um, Barbara, are you likely to be coming along to next week's webinar? Because I can certainly have a sort of a, a resource page for both of these um, at the end of that webinar, if that would be of oh, interest. We could, we, could, we could maybe put something in the YouTube description when we met, put the video. And I can put, yeah, we can put yeah. something in the YouTube description. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, Peter asks, is keying out the best way to start learning plant identification? Um, keying out is essential for whenever you want to start distinguishing between different species within one genera uh, or different genera within groups where um, they all look pretty similar. It's like the, the dandelion flowered, uh, dandelion like flowered. Um, daisy family, the, the yellow sort of multiple um, florets. Um, I think it's worth it's worth practicing your keying, even if you know what something is. If you know what something is, it's a good idea to just look it up in the index, find out where it is, and just read the description. Because apart from anything else, it means that you start getting used to the terminology, to how the book works. Um, and also it might you might sort of realize that oh there are a couple of other things that actually look quite close to this. Have I am I sure that I've got the right thing? You know. I managed to get myself completely um wind up by autumn, um, autumn hawk bit, I think it is, that uh just was growing everywhere and looked very different everywhere it was growing. So I just got myself completely wind up that it was different things. And of course, it wasn't. <laughs> it was all one plant being very, very able to cope with lots of different habitats and uh, substrates. Is it essential for you to start learning plant identification? No. Um, but like I said, it's very easy to get it wrong if you're just playing snap with the pictures. And this is why, and like I said, it's a good idea to read the descriptions at the very least. Make sure that you're looking at something which actually grows in the area that you are in or that grows in the kind of soil that you're dealing with or et cetera. You know, if you're dealing, if you think you're looking at something which only um, exists on Jersey or on some, uh, a few mountain ledges in the Highlands of Scotland and you're in Lincolnshire, then I think possibly, yeah. Those are the, those are the kind of things that I have certainly encountered as a as a botanist throughout my life, where I was determined I'd find um, a I can't remember precisely not what it was now, but only something that only grew in in uh, the South Downs, for example, and I was in Connemara on Acid Heathland. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's it's a good idea to do it probably. Excellent, thank you, Jen. And I'm I'm conscious we're we're a bit past the end. We'll do one more. Um, uh, Jen had mentioned marron grass as a pioneer species. Are the species that follow marron grass adapted in similar ways or, or have similar adaptations? Marron grass is actually uh, comes um, 
apologies if I if I said it was a pioneer species. It's an extremely important stabilizing species for blown sand. But the pioneer species that you get right at the front of um, of dunes that are beginning to grow are um, things like um, the lime lime grasses, which is a wonderful, very beautiful grass. It's quite sort of pale gray, green, and uh, much flatter leaf. The grey green is this hugely thick, waxy cuticle, so it it has that adapt adaptation rather than the capacity to roll itself up and produce some sort of long, very long roots like marum, uh, as well as um, seed cooch grass. Those are the two which are the real pioneers right at the front of the embryo dunes, and they start the process of stabilising blown sand. And actually, marum really doesn't like getting its doesn't like having a lot of salt at its roots. So it it is very much a plant which you will find growing a couple of meters into these uh, juvenile dunes, uh, and where it's really important to start stabilizing the the sand um, and allowing other uh, plant types to to start colonizing as well. Brilliant! Thank you ever so much. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get through, um, get to your question in the Q&A. We will get a copy of all these questions afterwards. And um, if there's anything else significant in there, we can try and answer them in um, the kind of uh, in the information that goes up with the YouTube video or, or something like that, um, if we can. Um, but of course, I don't want to keep people too late into the evening. Um, thank you ever so much um jen for that talk uh i can't believe that an hour and a bit has gone so quickly um i'd also like to you know thank to everyone that's joined us and uh thank you all for your questions and i'd also like to thank um our funders dara for making uh this talk our entire series of talks and this entire project possible um our next uh, talk in this series is the same time next Tuesday, which is getting started with flower anatomy. And uh, the entire series of webinars will go up on YouTube in time, uh, depending on how quickly I can edit them and get them uploaded, etc. So um, if you want to review this, uh, in case you've forgotten something or if you can't make a future talk that you, you wish you could, they will be um, available to you down the line. And so um, with that, um, I'm going to um, bring this uh, first webinar to a close. Thank you so much, Jen. There's loads of people in the chat saying thank you. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of you participants, attendees um, next week or at future uh, talks as well. Thank you. Ever my, so much. Yeah, my absolute pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Take care.